and welcome to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast, a podcast where we discuss all things relating to your well-being, including interviews with experts in the fields of nutrition, physical and mental health, and my five-minute food fact series. I am Amanda Hayes, your host, a lawyer turned nutritionist. I have a deep curiosity about well-being, and I'm trying to learn as much as I can about living a healthy, active and fulfilling life, and hopefully sharing some of those learnings with you. Before I introduce today's guest, I will mention that, although I will often be speaking with experts, any information or advice provided in Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast is not intended to be used to treat, cure, or prevent injuries or medical conditions, and is not a substitute for advice from your own health professionals. Today, I am here with postdoctoral researcher from the University of Tasmania, Olivia Swan. Olivia was born and grew up in Hobart. She attended the University of Tasmania, where she completed a Bachelor in Biotechnology and Medical Research with honours, majoring in Physiology. Olivia is just about to submit her PhD, the subject of which was looking at dietary fibre and its association with inflammation and depression in adolescents. I have a personal interest in this topic because I have three adolescent children. The more I know about ways I can help care for their mental health, the better. So let's meet Olivia. Hi, Olivia. Welcome to Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast. Olivia, you've just about completed your PhD at the University of Tasmania Um, looking at dietary fibre and its association with inflammation and depression in adolescence. And that will be the main focus of our discussion today. But just before we start that, I I wanted to ask you about living in Tasmania. So you grew up and you are still living in Tasmania, which is one of Australia's most beautiful places. So could you tell us a little bit about what you like or enjoy about life in Tasmania, assuming you do? (laughs) Yes, I love it here. It's small. That's always a great thing. Mm. It's big cities are nice and I really enjoy going on holidays to them. But being able to have somewhere peaceful is to live is, is great. Honestly, I don't take advantage of the wonderful outdoors aspect of things as much as I probably should. Yes, it is a very beautiful state. I've done quite a bit of hiking there over the years. I really love it. Very good hiking, yes. It, it has lots of different varieties of tracks as well. So anyway, let's get on to um, our topic of the day. So what sparked your interest in your PhD topic? So it sort of started with nutrition. My degree was actually very lab based and I decided I didn't want to go down that path Mm -hmm. at the end of it. So looking back at the things I had really enjoyed throughout my degree, nutrition really stood out for me. And it ended up being very good timing actually that started doing that because my supervisor uh, Wendy Oddy she had just come to Tasmania and started a job with Menzies at -hmm. the time that I was starting to plan my PhD so that timing worked out really well and she luckily gave me the freedom to choose my own project wonderful so the the interest in mental health was a really obvious thing for me like I see so many people around me that are struggling with issues Mm -hmm. and the idea of being able to find something that might help them is really attractive. But it, it actually took me a little bit longer to get onto fibre. So mm-hmm. I knew I liked diet and mental health, but I was going through all these different nutrients trying to decide what to look at. And it was actually my dad in the end that suggested fibre oh. because there was heaps in the media at the time about the microbiome and all of its disease links, which was really intriguing to me that just the bacteria in your gut would affect you so much since fibre is what impacts what your um, bacteria feeds on it sort of it was the the logical thing to look at for me. Excellent it is a very very interesting area and I think one of the most exciting things about it is that there is so much I feel like we're almost on the tip of the iceberg in terms of understanding the microbiome and it's it's almost as if there's new information coming out all the time and and as you say we certainly now know that there is a link between what's happening in our gut and what happens in our brain yeah very simply 
and the what's changed in the time of my PhD as well, mm. what we now, know now compared to when I started. Yeah, it's going so fast. That's only a couple of years, isn't it? When did you start? 2019, did you say? 2017. 17, sorry. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Well, when I studied nutrition, we barely even talked about the microbiome, and I'm sure it's not like that anymore. Mm. So if we talk first about dietary fibre, I think most people are pretty familiar with the concept that dietary fibre is good for your digestion, and this is definitely true. But the health um, benefits of dietary fibre, as you've already alluded to, extend beyond that. So I think it would be good to start the discussion off to just get an understanding of what dietary fibre is. So perhaps you could explain that to us in, in broad terms, Olivia. So if you start with the technical definition, and there's more than one definition, it's changing all the time. Mm -hmm. But basically it's that fibre is non-digestible carbohydrates obtained from plants. It includes things like non-starch polysaccharides, resistant oligosaccharides, lignin, resistant starch, all sorts of really complicated things. Um, to put it more simply, it's just the bits of plants that you can't digest in your stomach. So it passes through your intestine where it then feeds the bacteria there. Mm -hmm. um, so some types of fibre, it's really obvious. So it's things like cereals, wheat bix, bran, whole grain bread. Yep. But there are also some other ones which are not, at all obvious. So things like pectin, which is found in some fruits and is what makes jam set and yep. you can buy it to add to jam. Things like gums as well, which can actually be used commercially as thickness in foods and resistant starch as well, which comes from foods that wouldn't stand out to you as fibrous necessarily. That's right. And as you said, there are different types and, and there are also different ways, I believe, of classifying them. But some one way is they're either soluble in water or insoluble that's certainly one way of classifying them and you also mentioned resistant starch and they all do slightly different things in the body too i think is that correct yeah the soluble fibers as you say they dissolve in water they also can absorb water and make gels so most fibers many of them are at least partially soluble mm -hmm. and uh, so an example of them is if you've ever gotten psyllium or flaxseed and added water to it, the way it makes a gel and gets all thick, and the same of adding water to oats to make porridge. As far as their health benefits go, the most, uh, one of the biggest health benefits of soluble fibre, I think, is that they are relatively well known to reduce cholesterol. So the main one for that is uh, a thing called beta-glucan, which is found in oats, yeah. and that's fairly, there's fairly good evidence for that for cholesterol. And also they have benefits for uh, uh, diabetes and in insulin sensitivity and uh, blood glucose, controlling blood glucose levels. Other benefits, so there's laxation, as you say, gastrointestinal health, and that also applies to the insoluble fibre. That's the stuff that doesn't dissolve, and that's particularly helpful for that. Mm -hmm. um, resistant starches are fairly similar to soluble fibres really. They act in much the same way. There are four types of them though. So there are uh, the first type are uh, fibres, starches that are non-digestible because they're protected by cell walls. Okay. So they're the kind of ones you can find them in grains and seeds and legumes, those sort of things. The second type is found in raw foods. So examples of potatoes and bananas, green bananas. I'm not Yuck. really sure exactly <laughs> why anyone would want to eat raw potato or green bananas, but it's there. <laughs> um, and my favourite type of resistant starch comes from foods which normally contain digestible starch, like pasta and rice and potato. And if you cook them and then cool them down again, it goes through a process called retrogradation, which turns the digestible starches into non-digestible resistant starches. Um, the caveat with that, though, is that if you heat them again, the, it turns back into uh, digestible starch, so you need to eat them cold. Okay, so potato salad and rice salad are back on the menu, and people. pasta salad, yes. And pasta as long salad. <laughs> as long as you eat it cold. Cold. Um, the last type is synthetic fibres, just kind of produced chemically in the lab. Okay. But yeah, similar health benefits to the soluble fibres. Mm -hmm. 
So how much fibre should we aim to eat? So I mean, just uh, I guess just look at adolescents and adults because it, it does vary, I think, with age. It does, yeah. Australia has adequate insect guidelines, which they developed by looking at a population that had basically good laxation, um, good gastrointestinal health, and seeing what the fibre intake of that population was. So it's different for different age groups and different sex groups. So for adolescent boys, which is the age group that I am looking at, it's 28 grams of fibre a day. Whereas for adolescent girls, it's 22 grams of fibre a day. Mm -hmm. And for adult males, it's 30 grams and adult females, 25 grams. Is it higher for males because they're generally bigger? Is that the reason? So I suspect so. They eat more, basically. So as I said, this is based off looking at the actual intakes Mm -hmm. of a real group of people. So I think, yes, they eat more food, therefore likely they get more fibre. Yeah. Well, that makes sense. So are Australian adolescents eating enough dietary fibre? In short, no. (laughs) (laughs) If you look at national data, it's, uh, I think this is from around the early 2000s, less than 30% of people in the 14 to 18 year age group had met the adequate intake levels and if you split that by sex around 28 percent of boys and 31 percent of girls so girls actually do eat slightly more still nowhere near enough i wonder why that is i wonder if it's because they're eating too many foods that don't contain fiber in other words more processed types of foods i think that would be it yeah where yeah like as just as a society as even in the entire world, people are substituting unprocessed foods for processed foods. Yeah, that's true. Mm. Yeah. Of the dietary fibre that adolescents do actually eat, what, what are the major sources? I did a study on this one. Yes, that's right. You <laughs> yes, did too. Yes, this is why I'm here. Um, so I looked at the intake and the sources. So probably to start with intake. Um, I looked at ages 14 to 17 because I used data from uh, a study called the RAIN study, Mm -hmm. which is from Western Australia. And it started off as a pregnancy study, looking at pregnant women. And after the women gave birth, they they, uh, enrolled their children as well. And they followed the children and the mothers up all the way through to adulthood. So from this group of people, I've got them at 14 years and 17 years and looked at their fibre intake in them. What I expected to see is a decrease in fibre intake from 14 to 17, because like a lot a lot of things change during yeah. that age period. 14, think, you're in school, yeah. your, your parents got no money, parents probably control a lot of your diet. Mm. Compared to 18, you're working at university, you've got much, much more input over what you eat. Yes. So we expect this to decrease. Bigger adolescents have probably started eating more junk food, that kind of yep. thing. <laughs> yep, it happens. I've seen it yep. with my own eyes. <laughs> yes, I went through that as well. <laughs> and I also looked at family because of such family are such a big influence at that age. Yep. So like the national data, they didn't eat enough. They did at least eat slightly more. So they were about 40, 42% met the adequate intake guideline that. 14 and 36 percent at 17 Mm -hmm. so it is better than that 30 percent yeah in the national ones but their fiber intake did decrease as we expected so overall fiber decreased fiber per megajoule decreased as well and the reason we looked at that is because as you eat more food you get more fiber yeah of course so and i can kind of show you how that works into things in girls they ate less fibre at 17 than 14, but they also decreased their energy intake. Whether right. that was lower energy requirements or dieting, I don't know. But as a result of that, their fibre intake per megajoule of energy actually was the same at 14 right. and 17. The fibre density was the same. Compared to in boys, where they actually had the same amount of fibre intake, that didn't change but their energy intake went up. They started right. eating more food. So the fibre density of their diet actually got lower, got worse. Right. Yeah, that does actually make sense to me, just 
observing my own offspring yeah. <laughs> and how they eat and how how I do have less control over it than I did have um, when they were a bit younger. But anyway. So the sources yes. of them, going back to that, um, the food groups I chose to look at were cereals and grains, fruits, vegetables, nuts, legumes and discretionary foods, mm -hmm. which is things like pizza, meat pies, well, those kind of foods that will have a level of fiber in them, but not at all what is recommended. Yeah. So cereals and grains were the biggest contributor to mm -hmm. fiber intake, all groups, all ages, um, and that was between 40 and 50%. And that's not really surprising because we do eat so many cereals and grains. It's breakfast, it's sandwiches, yeah. all of those things. Uh, fruits was next, and then vegetables, which I put down probably to people just not eating enough vegetables. That's yeah. pretty well shown. And the discretionary foods contributed around 10 12% towards their fibre intake. So right. con considering those foods are generally quite low in fibre, it's quite a large contribution. Quite high, yeah. Mm. Yeah. It was interesting as well to look at the individual food items because they – the contribution of food items didn't match the fiber content. So looking at 14 year olds, the biggest individual food that contributed to fiber was apples or pears, which was almost 10% of fiber they right. got from that. Whereas it's actually only 2% fiber. So the amount of fiber in it is fairly low, but they ate so much of it. And it's okay. the same with white, there's white bread in that age group was the second highest contributor. Right. Okay, well, um, white bread wouldn't have much fibre. No, it doesn't have a lot, mm. about 4%. Mm. But then if, if you look at the things that had the highest fibre, uh, so looking at bran, that's really high fibre, and wheat germ, and they 0.05% of fibre came from bran, 0.01% from wheat germ. So I can't say those, I'm too surprised to hear that. Yeah. <laughs> The really high fiber items, just people don't eat them. Yeah, but but I mean, vegetables obviously have high fiber, and it really does sound quite clearly that adolescents are not eating enough of those. Yep. And Olivia, what were some of the factors that influenced how much dietary fiber adolescents consume? What we found is that the the adolescents who had parents with a formal education. So that is basically they completed year 12, TAFE or uni and compared to not completing year 12 at all. And they all had higher fibre intakes, but particularly university educated parents. Mm -hmm. The children with at least one university educated parent had the highest. Another one was family functioning. So we looked at family functioning as a measure of communication and support in the family, basically. So I found that those with a poorer family functioning had lower fibre intakes. And this, I mean, we don't know exactly why that is, but we can sort of guess that poor family functioning we know is associated with a deficiency or overabundance of independence. So either, I see. either they have too much independence, lack of supervision, so they're eating whatever they like, or they're restrict, really restricted in their diet, which studies have shown when that happens, when that restriction is taken off, they have poorer children and adolescents have poorer regulation of their own food intake. Right. So a lot of it comes down to education then from the sounds of what you're saying. Yeah. Yeah. And just, just the way that, that the families relate to each other, yes. I guess. Olivia, if we, if we move on to some of the research that you've continued to do, this year you've had two papers published in the British Journal of Nutrition, which is fabulous. So the first one was Dietary Fibre Intake and its Association with Inflammatory Markers in Adolescents. And the second one was Dietary Fibre Intake and its Associations with Depressive Symptoms in a Prospective Adolescent Cohort. So Perhaps you can start off by telling us what was unique about your research? So a big thing that I did that a lot of people haven't is focusing on the adolescent age group. So uh, particularly with inflammation, 
a lot mm. of research focuses on people that have diseases as well. So heart disease, diabetes, which is totally understandable because you want to try and improve their their symptoms. Whereas uh, less look at what you what you basically consider to be a low level of inflammation that can be damaging your health but doesn't necessarily have really obvious disease symptoms associated with it. So there's very little research in that, which mm -hmm. is what I was looking at, of populations that were generally healthy. And also I think because adolescents don't have those sort of inflammatory diseases so much, there just isn't the research in that age group. Yeah, that, that makes perfect sense. I mean, partly because they're younger, so... It hasn't had time to develop. That that would be one reason. But yeah, can you explain to us what inflammation is in a, I guess in a quite a general and in a physiological sense, but in a general easy to understand way. <laughs> I'll try. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, it's it's not that complicated. Um, so inflammation is like for starters, it's not always a bad thing. It's, it's really important. It's part of your immune system and it's the way your body actually deals with infections and invaders. So it's really important you have it. Um, you might recognise it, might be familiar if you get a cut, for example, and it gets infected. It'll go red, it'll get hot, it'll be painful. All of those things are symptoms of what we call acute inflammation, mm -hmm. which is basically you get hurt, the body reacts. It should then, once you've beaten that infection, go away again. Chronic inflammation is what I was interested in, and it's what happens when the immune system isn't regulated uh, as it should be. So what happens is even after the trigger for inflammation is resolved, it lingers on in the body. So it doesn't go away. And that is a problem, basically. It's been having chronic inflammation. It's been linked to heart disease. It's been linked to diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, metabolic syndrome, potentially some autoimmune diseases as well. There's right. a lot of bad things associated with it. If someone perhaps doesn't have a frank disease, how do they know that they might have inflammation? Or in other words, how can we measure inflammation? Uh, it's basically through blood tests. Mm -hmm. So one of the most common ones is they do a test for something called C-reactive protein, which is what they call an acute phase inflammatory reaction. It means that in the well, as soon as your body detects an infection, it spikes up massively, it gets really high, and then that's, that's what you see in that phase. But it also can be used to measure chronic inflammation mm -hmm. as well. There are some other... Um, other blood markers like interleukins, you can look at red blood cells and the way they behave. But a common one is C-reactive protein, and right. that's what I was looking at in this study. So in that study with uh, about inflammation, what did you find? I didn't find an association with fibre and CRP, which was unexpected because there's, in the adults certainly, there's a fair amount of literature right. saying that, that that association may exist. Um, we're not really sure why. It could be just that what we're saying, adolescents are too healthy. They just don't have enough inflammation for this effect to be seen. But another possibility is that all the, all the fibre data in all of my projects was collected from a food frequency questionnaire, right. which is where you give people a big booklet of foods and say in the last 12 months, how many times have you eaten apples, bread, everything else? Mm hmm so because it covers, it covers 12 months, it's a very wide time period, whereas the inflammatory markers are measured on one day. Right. So it's possible that because the, the free, free frequency questionnaire covers the broad, but may not be exactly what's happening in the days or weeks leading up to where the blood test is actually taken. Right, so oh, that makes it very complicated it to is. study. It's mm. very complicated. Yeah. I couldn't say for sure from my study that there's no association between right. fibre and inflammation, but I also looked at some other markers. So leptin and adiponectin are not really traditional markers of inflammation, but leptin has inflammatory properties mm -hmm. and adiponectin has anti-inflammatory properties. And I did find, I also looked at different sources of fibre 
we did find an association between having a higher intake of cereal and grain fibre and lower leptin. So that would mean that association shows that if you had a higher intake of cereal and grain, you had less inflammation. Is that what that would show uh, in lay yeah. terms? Yeah. Yeah. So less leptin. Leptin in the body stimulates immune cells to produce inflammation. So it's sort of a two-step process there. But it could mean, yeah, that through lowering leptin, you could then further down the line be lowering inflammation. Now it's time for a quick interlude. I enjoy reading and recommending wellbeing-related books. I've just posted a review of James Nestor's latest book, Breath, The New Science of a Lost Art, on the book reviews page on my website. The back cover blurb of this book hooked me in with this paragraph. No matter what you eat, how much you exercise, how skinny or young or wise you are, None of it matters if you're not breathing properly. Breathing is one of those things we all do automatically, like sleep. So I was really interested to find out more about it and some of the science behind it. So if you're also interested in learning more about it, I'll put a link to my review of breath in the show notes. And now back to my discussion with Olivia Swan. In basic terms, then, what do you think are the mechanisms between dietary fibre intake and inflammation? I mean, why did you even think this was a good thing to to look at? It's very difficult to put in simple terms. Yes, I but know. It goes, <laughs> um, it goes through the microbiota, basically. So if you have more fibre, you have a more healthy microbiota in, to um, make it simple. Having bad microbiota can create inflammatory compounds which can move from your gut to the blood and cause inflammation there. Having a good microbiota creates these things called short-chain fatty acids. Uh, These short-chain fatty acids can do three things. They can make it harder for bad bacteria to live in the gut, Mm -hmm. so you have less bad bacteria. They can tighten up the membrane between the gut and the blood, which means that if you have got any of those inflammatory compounds around, they can't get out. Right. And it's, there's not as much evidence for this. It's only been found in my studies, but they may actually be able to impact the immune cells in the blood directly. So the short-chain fatty acids get out into the blood and then go, go to work out there. Wow, that is fascinating. And that's all through what we eat. Yeah, That chain, much. That, that cascade, I guess, of, of reactions. Yeah. What all this seems to highlight to me is it's just it's so important to eat in a way that enhances your health and looks after your microbiome and dietary fiber is obviously a very important part of that. Yeah, and it's even even beyond the things I'm looking at. There are many health always emerging more health benefits of a good microbiome beyond even inflammation and depression. Yes, exactly. But I I understand that in scientific research, you do have to sort of drill down into one specific thing, don't you, to look at, yes. to study. Otherwise, my PhD would last forever. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> the never-ending PhD. Yes. So if we now look at the second study you did, which has a look at, at the association with depressive symptoms in adolescence, this is, to me, this is really interesting and it's such an important area because we know that depression is a major cause of disability in adolescence. I'll just give a few statistics about that just to paint the picture. So according to the Black Dog Institute, we know that one in four young people aged 16 to 24 are living with a mental disorder. We also know that people aged 18 to 24 years have the highest prevalence of mental disorder of any other age group. And sadly, youth suicide is the leading cause of death of young people aged 15 to 24. So clearly, from these statistics, adolescent mental health is a really important and pressing, I would say, public health issue. The causes of depression or other mental health disorders are obviously multifactorial. But if diet quality is associated with depressive symptoms, to me it represents a potentially um, very helpful, non-invasive way to assist um, young people. So 
Let's talk about your study. First of all, how did you conduct the study? You know, how did you find the participants? Um, how did you determine how much fibre they ate and things like that? The participants were the same ones as the previous studies. Mm -hmm. So again, from the RAIN study, those 14 and 17 year olds. We looked at fibre, as I said, from the food frequency questionnaire. In this particular study, I divided it. Sorry, you used the same data, did you, that you yes. used? Yep. Yeah. So all of my studies have been linked together with the same data. Yep. Um, in this particular study, though, we divided fibre intake into groups. So it was quartiles from lowest right. intakes through the highest intakes. Mm -hmm. Also, to look at their depressive symptoms, we used a questionnaire called the Youth Spec Depression Inventory, mm -hmm. which is a self-report questionnaire. So they get given a booklet, fill in the answers. There are 20 questions, which are about negative feelings in the two weeks before they fill it out. And they get assigned points for each answer and you get a scale of least to most depressive symptoms, right. essentially. And for this study, I divided it into two categories. So it's with those that have none or mild depressive symptoms and the people that had the moderate or extreme depressive symptoms. So then, Olivia, what were your overall findings from that study? The biggest finding we had, which is really exciting, was that the people that had the highest starchy fibre intake were the least likely to have moderate or extreme depressive symptoms. So they had much lower odds of having depressive symptoms than the people with the lowest intakes. We did look at the different sources of fibre as well. So that also went for the people that had the most cereal and grain fibre or fruit and vegetable fibre, but it wasn't as strong an association as we found with overall fibre. Right. That's... um fascinating to me as a mother of uh, three adolescent children it really does make me want to ensure that they are eating enough fiber i mean it's it's something that all parents can do really isn't it yeah and there is a confounder to it though okay something that could be messing with the results essentially um which is the rest of your diet yeah so okay yeah which for, for someone like a parent, if you're encouraging a high fibre diet, then you are getting all the other nutrients as well. But we found that adjusting for dietary patterns, so trying to adjust for, say, was it fibre or was it the fact that they're getting lots of B vitamins along with their fruits and vegetables, the strength of the association between fibre and depression was reduced, which right. means that, yeah, it's likely that it's not just fibre that's having the effect that it is the whole diet and everything yeah. associated with us. That, that makes sense to me as well because, you know, we, we eat food and everything that goes along with that. We don't just eat dietary fibre. You know, we eat exactly. fruit with, as you say, all the vitamins, minerals, antioxidants and everything that comes packaged with it. In, in other words, a really healthy style diet with lots of plant-based foods is probably a good thing for many reasons, including the dietary fibre, but other reasons as well. Yeah. I want to try and make you explain something for us again. So what do you think the possible mechanisms are between dietary fiber intake and depression or depressive symptoms? Probably the best thing to understand first is the different processes in the brain that we think might be involved in depression. Mm -hmm. So one is the neurotransmitter concentrations. So there's neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine, which is otherwise called noradrenaline, which are involved with depression. And a lot of antidepressants work by changing the concentrations of these, anti of these neurotransmitters mm -hmm. or the way that they are processed in the brain. Another one is this, this thing called the HPA axis, which is basically linked to your stress response, which has been linked to depression. And there are things called neurotrophins, which are chemicals in your brain that basically influence the health of neurons. So if you have more of them, in short, um, healthy neurons. One of the pathways from fibre to depression and the reason why it's in my PhD is inflammation. Mm -hmm. So the inflammation can reduce the levels of neurotransmitters in the brain, which means that you might be depressed because of that. It can also reduce the levels of the neurotrophins, which are, therefore you might have less healthy neurons and it activates that stress response, the right. HPA axis. And all of those things are linked to depression. In the, my study of depression, we actually looked at inflammation 
and saw uh, if we find an association in fibre and depression, what actually happens if you include inflammation on that pathway and found that in these people that actually made no difference at all. So it sort of suggested that perhaps in these people at least, in these adolescents, inflammation might not actually be one of the functioning pathways. Right. So it's the yeah. other pathways that you just mentioned then? Oh, the other pathways, same ones, but yep. they can happen apart from inflammation. Yes, sorry, that's so, what I'm... Yeah. Yeah, they, they can happen whether or not you have inflammation. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Is that correct? So the, micro, the microbiota can produce neurotransmitters itself. The bacteria can actually do it. And they can also produce precursors of neurotransmitters. Right. And also those short-chain fatty acids that are produced by the bacteria can impact cells and actually even impact the way that your body reads your DNA to change production of neurotransmitters again and also the neurotrophins, which affect your health of your neurons. So it's, it seems so far-fetched to think about it, but your bacteria can actually be having those sort of yeah. impacts in your brain. It's actually, it's extraordinary and it just shows how complex the human body is, doesn't it? Yes. Um, where do you think the research in this area is leading next? Do you have an idea of what might be a good follow-up kind of study to what you've been doing? If you accept that fibre does impact depression, mm -hmm. a, good, a good next step from that. So my research is just observational. You're looking at me going, sure. we saw this, we saw that. The best thing to do after that is to actually have studies where you intervene and you get people and make some sort of change in their lives. So I think there's two ways you can do it. One is to try and isolate the effect of fibre itself. And you do that by supplementing diet with fibre supplements. So you're not yeah. changing your diet. You're just putting in fibre. And the other is to look at a high dietary pattern. So like you were saying, have a... Um, encourage a high fiber diet and everything that comes along with this and also so to see what happens to people and to their depressive symptoms when you make those changes and also to look at diagnosed depression so I can show that more fiber equals less depressive symptoms but I can't say whether eating more fiber is of benefit to people who are actually clinically depressed right so that yeah that would be very interesting to know mm -hmm. wouldn't it yeah, that's a really important yeah. track of future research, I think. So it sounds like there's a lot of uh, potential in this space to hopefully help uh, people with depressive symptoms. I mean, there are so many things or interventions that can be done. You know, obviously there's a um, pharmacological type of interventions, but there's exercise and sleeping well and all sorts of other things that are good for our health. But clearly eating a diet that promotes mental well-being is something that we may see more of in the future yeah and i should say here also um don't ditch your antidepressants and add fiber instead like yeah no no <laughs> these things work together no definitely don't uh, don't um do anything without consulting with your medical professional for sure yes. olivia for someone who's listening who has adolescent children like me or who is an adolescent themselves what are some of your recommendations on trying to increase their dietary fiber intake? Uh, I have sort of two answers to the question. The first one is follow your dietary guidelines, yep. eat less unprocessed food, eat more fruits and vegetables. The second is my suggestions for picky eaters like myself. So there are things you can do to increase fiber. If you mm -hmm. can leave skin on fruits and vegetables, that's a really good way to do it. Substituting foods. So if you can substitute, there's some really good options now, like white breads, which have, which are fibre enriched, things like fibre enriched pastas that don't have the same flavour or texture, perhaps as wholemeal foods. Of course, the resistant starches from the potato salads and such. So I always think it's got to be something you can stick to. So yes, if, that's really important. If you find you love potato chips, you love snacks, you can't stop eating them, you can substitute higher fibre versions. So, for example, corn chips, they're like the proper thick ones, not quite Doritos. They are actually quite high in fibre, things like nuts and fruits as well. There are lots of ways you can sneak more fibre into your diet. Sure. Without perhaps having to go the whole way and eat only whole grains and 
legumes for dinner and that sort of thing. So it sounds like starting for a good starting point is to look at substitutions that can be made in your diet. Yeah. And do you have any general tips for eating well, particularly, I guess, focused in, uh, on adolescence? Yeah, try and try and stay unprocessed. I yeah, guess. that and would again, be my big thing. Find things that you like rather than trying to force yourself to eat a diet of things you hate. Find things that are healthy and that also you like eating. You don't have to eat every healthy thing in the world. You just need to find a selection that works for you. And Olivia, who or what inspires you? You could say, I guess, that all researchers in this area inspire me to a certain extent. I read their papers. It makes me think. In the field, though, of nutrition and mental health and particularly interventions, there's a lady from Deakin named Felice Jacka. Oh, yes, I've heard of her, yes. Yeah, she's really the front runner in Australian research and probably even international as well in looking at these associations. Excellent. To wrap up, the final question that I like to ask all of my guests is if you could recommend two things that all people could do to improve their well-being, what would they be? I'm going to be very unimaginative here. I think you probably get the same thing from everyone, but eat healthy and exercise more or less. <laughs> I get a lot of different responses. Uh, sleep is a big one as well, actually. Sleep's next on my list. Yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So if I get three, then sleep would be there. Sleep would be next. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate you taking the time to, to speak with us today. And that was Olivia Swan, postdoctoral researcher at the University of Tasmania. Thank you for listening today, and I do hope you found today's interview interesting. If you did, please share the podcast and tell your friends about it. And if you could take a minute to leave a rating on Apple Podcasts, it will help other people to find it. If you would like to subscribe to my podcast, Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast, you can subscribe on all good podcast providers like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, Overcast, iHeartRadio and Google Podcasts. You can also subscribe on YouTube. Please follow me on Instagram and Facebook at Amanda's Wellbeing Podcast and check out my website at www.amandaswellbeingpodcast.com. You can contact me via the contacts page on my website. And if you would like to suggest a person you'd like to hear interviewed or a topic you'd like to learn more about, please do let me know and I will do my best to deliver that to you. Producing the podcast is a labour of love. It has become my full-time job and I devote a lot of time, obviously, money and effort towards it. If you enjoy my podcast and would like to support it, I would be so grateful. You can make contributions via my Patreon page or via PayPal from the donate page on my website. And I will put a link to that in the show notes, so please check it out. Another way to support the podcast is to purchase a book from the book reviews page on my website. If you click on the Amazon link there, at no extra cost to you, I will receive a small commission when you buy a book because I'm an Amazon affiliate. Thank you very much for tuning in. Eat well, move well, think well.